Good morning, everybody. This morning's reading is 1 Corinthians 15, and in three sections, 35 to 39, 42 to 44, and 53 to 55. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives it its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. And 42, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And to 53. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? This is the word of the Lord. So let us tread gently on holy ground. For I have a note from a consultant that says to everyone in this church, unfortunately, you have a condition. That condition is fatal for every single one of us. There is no medicine and there is no cure. Anyone like to guess what that condition is? It's mortality. It's being human. In the funeral service we say from dust we are formed and to dust we must return. And this church of ours, along with the Diocese of Blackburn, have committed themselves to what we call mission. That's to take the message of Christianity out. Steve and Shirley go with our blessing to all different kinds of churches to help those churches who want to engage in mission. But for all my life as a Christian vicar, since I've been one, I've asked what message are we taking out there? What is it that we're offering them in a world full of offers? What is the point of mission? It can be about this life now. How we live it, what's good, what's honourable, what's noble. How Jesus, if you make him your Lord, can make your life better lived. Okay. But I'm going to suggest whatever we do in mission, at some point, you are going to meet someone who's going to say to you, I watched my grandma die. I lost my husband. Or as I found once two parishes ago, Can you come and see me? My 12-year-old girl has hung herself. Then they will ask you, what do you say? So here's my question for you Christians. What would you say? And please don't point at me and say that's your job to answer it. Because you've got to answer it too. Peter says, give a reason for the hope within you. Also, we went to something to do with mission on last Monday. And they showed a graph that said those who engage with the Christian faith, who are even intrigued by it, are intrigued by a friend. They ask, why do you have that hope? 26%, 2% ever do it with me. 
or someone like me. So you yourself, I ask you this question. If you were asked that question, what answer would you give? And please don't think it's gone in this secular world, because it isn't. We know in our world everything's capitalist, everything's about profit, it's about the here and now, the getting of things, and yet we have a society that's crying out, there must be more than this. Is all that there is getting a bigger house? Watching homes under the hammer and looking and thinking, 900,000, I can't afford that. But this getting more. I'm going to ask Steve, I'm sorry to drop it, I was going to share it, but he shared it a lot. Steve, where you are, would you tell people what happened to you that day? when you were a fireman, caught in that building. Would you mind, please? Yeah, from there, wherever you want. Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so what happened with me, I was in a, a, a fire situation, um, got into a building with a partner, um, both with breathing apparatus on, and, uh, and as we were progressing into the building, uh, and searching and doing different things, uh, part of the building collapsed. Um, and as the building collapsed, we were trapped inside. Um, our oxygen was running low, so we couldn't fight our way out. So we had to sit very, very quietly uh, and breathe very calmly and wait for rescue. So I set my emergency uh, distress signal off um, so that other people outside of the building would know that we were in trouble. Um, and then sit and just wait. And in those few moments that I was sitting and waiting, the thoughts that were going through my mind was, if I was to die today, and this, by the way, is before I became a Christian, if I was to die today, where would I go? Would I go to this place called heaven, um, or would I not? Um, and I think I could honestly say at that point, after hearing what other people said about Christianity, that I think I wouldn't have gone to heaven because I didn't know at that time Jesus Christ as my Lord. And so it was a time after that that I realized um, my need for Christ. Uh, and so by my own bed, I knelt and asked, asked Jesus into my heart uh, to come and live within me and to use me for his glory. Um, so sometimes it's fear. Uh, and and I, think, I think that the time we were sat waiting for to be rescued there was a, an amount of fear there. Uh, but also there was an amount of uh, realization that we had a good crew and they would come and save us. Um, yeah, so Thanks. that was my story. Thank you. It's there. Like Steve said, that moment, it comes. We're seeing it now in the presidential election where everyone's saying a man of 80 odd is not fit to be president. He could die at any minute. Who is the vice president? And what happens if they take over? So it's not gone away. People still ask the question. From the moment they marry, you know you can look back and say, we've been married, you age together. And I want to suggest there's two things going on. And we Christians who believe, and this is the message of mission is hope. This is what we're offering. We're offering hope, or trying to, that we've got slightly confused. Because I want to suggest to you what our culture says about death is this. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there and I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. Sorry, do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I do not die. Or, see that? Death is nothing. It's nothing at all. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still there. Don't cry. I'm the wind, I'm the glint, I'm, I'm the shining light. Or, oh, as I hear often, he's up there with grandma having a party. He's looking down on us now, he's having whiskey and he's giving a shot. Come back with me to Diana's funeral, Princess Diana's funeral. That's when this began to be really big. Let me read this, this is a blessing from Tom Wright. After Diana's death, one messy luncheon spoke as if it's the princess's own voice. I did not leave you at all. I am still with you. I am in the sun and in the wind. I am even in the rain. I did not die. I am with you all. Many funerals, Tom Wright says, memorial services and funerary inscriptions, that's on graves, now give voice to this kind of belief. In other words, death is some kind of spiritual release. 
we get rid of this body and we inherit something spiritual. Or we go back into the ether. We lose ourselves in the essence of creation. Which I'm gently going to suggest is going on in some of the green movement. The earth is divine. Gaia is the earth and the earth is replete with divinity. And what we want to do is lose ourselves within it. Something for me that struck me very hard. And again, Tom Wright quotes from this. This is Nick Hornby, a football fan, an <clears throat> Arsenal fan. But this is what he writes. Maybe we will die the night before our team appears at Wembley or the day after a European Cup first leg match or in the middle of a promotion campaign or a Steve and I know with Fleetwood a relegation battle. And there is every prospect, according to many theories about the afterlife, that we will not be able to discover the eventual outcome. The whole point about death, metaphorically speaking, is it's about to occur before the major trophies are awarded. Do you see what he's doing? He's looking at life and saying this could happen at any moment. And then he gives an answer which is very similar to Diana and very similar to Do Not Stand. And this is what he says next. He says, it would be nice to think I could hang around inside the stadium in some form, watch the first team one Saturday, the reserves the next. I would like to feel that my children and grandchildren will be Arsenal fans and that I could watch with them. That doesn't seem to me a bad way to spend eternity. Float around hybrid as a ghost, watching reserve games for the rest of time. You see? This, for me, is what our culture has imbibed about death. And let me go back to the beginning and say we've not stopped asking the questions. Secular man has not stopped asking the question. No matter what Richard Dawkins screams, no matter what Christopher Hitchens, the great new atheists who said religion and faith is... They're still asking questions. Tom Wright says this also. He wrote this. He was giving a lecture at Westminster Abbey. The newsletter advertised that the one of the Abbey's very own 17th century ghost might make his annual appearance around the same time. There are, of course, numerous popular phenomena on both sides of the Atlantic, such as the continuing Elvis cult in the States, which were categories of their own. How about this? The idea of ghosts, ghost hunters. Ghostbusters is back. New films of Ghostbusters. So there's this idea, which I want to suggest is kind of Eastern mystical, it, it comes out of a pagan idea that, in some ways, the flesh that we inhabit is something we need to put off. We need to lose it, because in itself, it's not great. What we want is this spiritual existence that removes us out of the body and into some kind of nirvana, is the word, isn't it? Where we can be the rain, we can watch our children. There was a, a book called The Lovely Bones, everyone read that? of a young lady that was murdered and it's her watching her parents deal with their grief. Do you ever remember the film Ghost? Do you remember Whoopi Goldberg? She was a fake and then suddenly a ghost appeared and she goes, oh my goodness, it's real! It hasn't gone anywhere. But let me ask you this then, Christians. If you're a Christian and you believe, what answer are you going to give? Are you going to give that one? That somehow we just don't exist anymore. Or that we're glints on snow, we're up there dancing. And please don't say, oh, no, 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 that's not Christian. Because, let me read you this. The next one. Oh, why is it that you never, ever have it in it when you want it? And I've, I had the thing and I've lost it now. Here we go. Here we are. I've got it. But he, he says this. For lo, the days are hastening on by prophets and bards foretold. When with the ever-circling years comes round the age of gold. When peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling... The whole will give back the song which now the angels sing. Which song is that? It's Christmas song, isn't it? Which one is it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yes. And I'm going to quote Tom Wright, word for word here. It is a well-loved Christmas carol, but the idea of cycles of history eventually returning to a golden age is neither Christian nor Jewish, but it is decidedly pagan. While we're on this, consider a way in a manger, which prays fit us for heaven to live with thee there. So what I'm suggesting, I think, we Christians have done, is taken the idea of heaven, that's where we go, and we kind of mingled it with this idea of the pagans, that it's kind of heaven, it's a spiritual nothing. Because again, I think that comes back to, what is this? What is this body? What's the point of it? Why is it inhabited? Why is it what we've got? And that brings you back to what you think the body is for. And then we confront and center what I think Christians have done with sexual intercourse too. 
They've made it that, oh, it's only for the creation of babies and not to be enjoyed. That, again, has Greek influences. That, again, is this philosophy that juxtaposes the body and the spirit as two opposites. One not good, one great. That's why monks in the ancient world used to go away and whip their bodies. But we've been doing a Bible study on Song of Songs and come to the conclusion that that book in the Bible says sexual intimacy with your husband and wife is something you can and should enjoy. It is not corrupt. It is not wrong. It is not bad. Because we do that. We split it. And I think our world does. We want this spiritual nothing. So I'm going to park that there and hope you agree. And even, it's even come into some Christian things, like Tom Wright has said with that carol. And also, unfortunately, with this. We commend to your mercy and pray that as you gather him or her to yourself, you will give us those blessings and peace. We entrust him to your mercy and pray show the path of life and the fullness of joy in your presence. It's the same thing. But is it Christian? Is it what the Bible says? And is it the answer you would give? I'm not saying it doesn't bring comfort. It probably does. And often with those who grieve, it's comfort we want to give. But I'm coming back to this idea and I'm treading on holy ground. We're doing mission. What answer do we give? What answer do we give to those out there that have no Christian faith? What about those who are here today who are grieving like Ian and his Christian faith? Myra, when she lost Keith. You, dear Rob, when you lost Karen. What are we going to say? Because I repeat, it's not always going to be me that gives the answer. It's you. So let's look at what Paul says for a moment, if I may. This is what he says. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. This was an argument about what was going on in Corinth. They were saying there is no resurrection, like we hear. Utter drivel. Drivel! No, the dead don't rise. And that little girl that I told you about, that I went to the coffin because the family asked me to and she killed herself. The reading for me that I was preaching on the following Sunday was, little girl, I tell you, arise. Did I say that to that girl? Yes. Did she arise? No. So we have to front and centre that, don't we? And they're arguing it didn't happen, or it's already happened. So Paul is trying to say to them, whoa, whoa, stop. Stop. And now comes the heart of Christianity. A historical event. Not, as the Bishop of Durham said, a conjuring trick with bones. Not, as many Christian preachers say now, that it didn't actually rise. It was a spiritual thing. They felt his presence with him. I haven't got time to go into just the nonsense that is. The tomb was empty. The body was not there. The dead man had risen. Not an animated corpse. A body, living, talking, eating, sitting with Peter, walking on the road to Emmaus. With what kind of, Next one, Sally, please. So Paul is saying this. This body of ours, yes, indeed, must die. We cannot, as I said at the beginning, we are mortal, we do not live forever. It must go at some point. And then it's a seed, he says. Don't you understand the gardening metaphor here, Paul is saying? That you plant a tiny seed and you don't know what it will become, but it becomes something much bigger. Next one, please. So he's saying the resurrection of the dead. This is what he's saying. This body of ours is perishable. But it's going to be raised imperishable. It is a bodily resurrection. We are not ghosts sitting on harps, playing tennis on clouds. Let me read what Tom Wright has said about that Christmas carol again. This is what he says about away in a manger. No resurrection, no new creation, no marriage in heaven on earth. That's just not in these songs. It's not there. When really what we want to be saying is this, if I can find it again. I keep losing my place. Oh, never mind. I won't find it now, will I? <sighs> He's saying this. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. We are weak. We wear out. So the offer of Christian hope to a hurting world is not some ephemeral thing where we go ghost hunting and we put people in a haunted house and hope for the best. It is a bodily resurrection. So what I want to say to Ian, what I want to say to you, Rob, and you, Myra, is this. They are now with the Lord in heaven. Because he says, I am the God of the living, not the dead. They are alive in his presence. But yet, this has not happened. But it will. They will be raised 
and given a new body for eternity. It will never wear out. It will never break down. And as Tom Wright says in the scripture, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. This idea where we go to heaven. No, 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 no. Yes and no. God says, I will make all things new in Revelation. A new heaven and a new earth. This earth where Lebanon's firing rockets and the Houthis are, when we've got people on boats, all of that goes. God recreates. And yes, I understand when we do mission that people think, oh, this is kind of a bit weird. How can you possibly believe? Because our faith is built on a historical event. That a man who was dead rose again. It will be clothed with imperishableness. Immortality. This body's mortal. It cannot inherit immortality. But the one that he has prepared for us will. And someone said to me, how will he do it? I said, well, excuse me, what do you mean? How, how's he going to do it? I said, well, he doesn't need to do it by Friday at five so he can go to Witherspoon's, you know. <laughs> he has quite a while to work this out. Because there's been how many people alive? I read... 900 million people over the world watched the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics. 1.2 billion supposedly saw the whole thing overall. It's a lot of people. So he needs a bit of time. But look what he's saying. You will be clothed. Next one, Sally, please. Clothed with imperishable. The mortal with the immortal. That's what Paul's trying to say to them. This is no, oh, I just want to go and float on the harp. So I'm in the middle of... No, he's saying, listen, listen. Now let me come to death itself, because that is what this kind of culture says. It's, oh, it's nothing. Just put it off. That's what euthanasia says. I'm nothing. It doesn't matter. I don't want to suffer anymore. Let me just go. But what he's saying here is it's a bodily, repeating again, a bodily resurrection. He will raise you up. He will breathe into you. Death is not anything in scripture than an enemy. It's an intrusion. It is not welcome or wanted. We read, oh, Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, what I read at the beginning. The word is angry. Jesus is angry at what death has done to Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And Mary and Martha confront what you and I confront. Lord, if you'd have been here, where were you? And then he says to them, you'll rise. And they knew this. They were Jews. They understood there was a resurrection over there at the end of time once and for all. And then this weird faith called Christianity comes along and says, no, 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 it's happened now. In the middle of time, so a fireman unsure of the future can ask the question, what happens to me if I die today? And receive the answer that says, where do you want to go? What is your answer? And here is the answer. So Paul sees death as an enemy. Something that will eventually be defeated. It hasn't been yet, but it will be. And we sing a song, we sang it before in the nine o'clock, that the loved ones we will see again and the word is reunited. We reunited with them. I don't mean this rudely, Ian, Rob, we can't. They will never come to us, but we will go to them and be reunited in a new body. And again, Paul goes on about angels. He says, you will be like them. Not as they are, but like them. Somehow, I don't know how this works or when. But that's the hope I want to give to those who say, what happened to my grandma? What happened to that boy that fell in the ravine? But as Steve said, there is a condition here. And this is where the Christian faith goes. And that's when you get the people like Jesus turning and go, oh, they all gone? Where have they gone? Because we don't like the message. For the message is, we can't do it our own way. We have to accept that we have indeed, like Steve said, gone our own way. That there is a way of repentance to turn around and come back to accept that Christ died in our place. For I preached on Cain and Abel, and just let me take Abel for a moment. Cain, sorry. Cain, the story is, you know the story of Cain and Abel? The two children, they fall out, the brothers. And Cain offers an offering that he wants because he thinks he can however he chooses to God. He shakes his fist in God's face. He says, I'll do it my way. That's the human way. I'll do it my way. And again, gently, gently, when I come to funerals, how many times have I sat with people who have said, ah, but he's a good person. He did these things according to the morality of the world. That's enough. He's in heaven, isn't he? Back to that idea again. Is he in heaven? Hint for one second that he might not be. And watch the reaction. Because that's the Cain idea. I can earn salvation. I know what's moral. I know what's good. Tell me how I've lived well and then send me to heaven. Make me this kind of, I am not there, I do not weep. 
Whereas the Christian faith says, no, 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 no. You have to come like Abel does, with a right offering, with the acceptance that God is holy and we are not. And that we who inhabit this body go our own way. The world is rebel. That's what Martin Lloyd-Jones said to um, Joan Bakewell in an interview. And she laughed. He said, man, I can't do the Welsh accent, Helen, sorry. Man is a rebel. And she just looked at him and smirked. But that's the Christian message. That those who grieve do not need to. And again, I'm going to finish here soon. Look at this and listen again where Paul says, do not grieve as others do who say there's no hope. Please hear me. He doesn't say don't grieve. He doesn't say to Ian, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt because I know it doesn't. Ian knows it does. Rob knows it does. Saying, oh, we're just on the clouds doesn't. No, it hurts because it's an enemy that shouldn't be here. But he says, don't grieve as if there's no, excuse me, hope. This book is called Surprised by Hope. And this is the aching of mission. This is why I think we do mission, why we send Stephen Shirley out with our blessings, because we want to bring hope, hope to this world, hope to mortals that there's immortality, hope that they can turn around and find a new beginning like Steve. And then if you talk to Steve, he'll tell you for a while his brother was a Christian and Steve did every blooming thing he could to trip him up. But then he saw in his own brother a witness that eventually brought this man to Christ and there he sits now. So this says, says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Next one, Sally, please. So then he can say, where is your victory? It isn't. Because Christ is the first fruits, Paul says. He rose from the dead. We don't have to get into, oh, oh, what will it look like? What kind of body will it be? Will it be like this? Will it be like that? No, no, no. We just have to know. That's the promise he has given. And the Bible says, and I finish, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. If he has given us that hope, that is the hope we will inherit. Later on, we're going to sing, there is a higher throne. And then it will say, as thirst and hunger die, we'll stand before him. But nobody, but nobody can force you to believe this. You yourself, as Christians, have to ask. Now, please, be theologians. Be Bereans, like it says in Acts 17. Search the scriptures. Ask yourself honestly, if you are a believer in Christ, what would you say? And please don't say, oh, no, theology is not me. I can't do it. I'm too thick. It's not true. You can and you must, because you have to give a reason. So what would you say then, after everything I've said today, if someone out there later today says to you, what happens to the dead? What would you say to them? Oh, they're just on clouds up there partying, yeah. Or would you say, hang on a second, I want to tell you there's a hope of resurrection, of bodily resurrection, of life eternal, and this is the path to get to it. What's your answer for yourself? Because if it is that hope, then that hope sustains us. That's what drove the church in mission in its early years. Hope that death is not the end. That we can live a life now with Christ like Steve's found of joy and hope and uplifting and songs. But ultimately, that I can say to Ian, with all the love in my heart, sir, he will wipe every tear from your eye. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying will be no more. For the old order of things will pass away. When Ian, I don't know. I don't. But I say to you, Sue, with my whole heart, it will happen. And I say to you, Rob, it will happen. To Myra, it will happen. Where, oh death, is your victory? Where is your sting? Let me finish here with this. The body that is sown perishable, that is raised imperishable. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. And this bit of a spiritual body, it means God's breath is within you. The power that God had that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that will be in you when he gives you this new body. And that day you see them. When you see them again, think of that joy. For now we see through a glass darkly, then we will see face to face, says Paul. Now we're only partially, then we'll be fully known. And you know, the disciples said, he said, it's not for you to know. He said, Jesus, is it now? Is it now? And he said, it's not for you to know. But you be about my work. What's the work? Mission. What's the mission? Hope. What's the hope? Well, I've come full circle. That is the hope. Or we have nothing. For Paul later on says, if the dead are not raised, then we are liars. We have no hope. If Christ is not raised, Steve's wasted his time. He should have just carried on being a fireman and done what he wanted. But if Christ is raised, we have hope. That's why we've sung the victor's crown. Abide with me. All of them, sorry I know I've said, all of them are that cry. Oh Lord, we want you. 
Lord, we know we're mortal. We need you. And that's what I want this church to be, a church of mission that brings hope to the broken. In a world that's still searching and asking questions about life and death, this is our answer. Finish again. Let me say it one more time. A bodily resurrection. A new heaven and a new earth. A marriage feast of the two. And joyous life everlasting. Not harps on clouds. Not floating around. A real physical body. To see Jesus face to face. I leave it there. Please be theologians. And if we had communion today, we don't. I would have said to you, when you come forward and you receive this bread, ask. Why did he need to die? What was the point? And, and then he rose. What's the point of that? Ask the question. And then please search. Search with all your heart. This is the answer that we've got. That one day I'm going to shake Keith's hand. One day I am and I'm going to... I'm going to do this to him, Myra. I'm going to put my finger out and say, when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. You used to do it to me, it's my turn. I'm going to see Grant, and I'm going to say, thank you, sir, for putting me in here with Jackie and to all saints, letting me serve the people of God in hope. Finish there. We could go on for a lot more. There's so much more to say. Because it's our hope. And now our next song is... I. Steve chose this but it's the one I would it's called I will rise he will call my name do you believe this at the beginning I am the resurrection and the life then he says do you believe this so I'm going to ask you as you sing this song do you believe this what's your answer be a theologian hear the words of this song let's stand and sing of our great faith I will rise thank you gents <laughs>